plan. Take the start of the right and stay on until morning. Neverland. today there we go new recording since, started okay cool there we go since you're a playstation junkie like myself well i'm not quite a junkie on it yet because i'm still uh doing uh xbox 360 i need to figure out if there's a way like how you were able to uh send all of your uh, points you've earned and everything on playstation I'm, i think there should be a way i should be able to go on the xbox website and be able to post that up too and say yeah see there here's where i'd be pretty much the same because we've played a lot of the same games i've just played it on a different system i think there are I, I think there are there are aggregator websites like like my playstation quote unquote gamer score it's just the conversion <laughs> yeah that's uh you know somebody they pre- the pretty much accepted ratios: a, a bronze is fifteen, a silver is thirty, a gold is ninety, and a plat is one hundred and eighty. Hmm. And they all they, they come out comes out very very close to a to an Xbox gamer score huh. well, or game games there. game score or whatever they call. It. There's there's tons of websites that do it. So I know I've got a lot of gamer points on that thing, and so far with the uh, the PlayStation, the only thing I've done that's gotten me any points is there's a few things on the WWE t- uh, 2K14, and then I finished uh, The Last of Us, um, and then I, I've downloaded some old PlayStation games, but those aren't giving me any points for playing them. So right now I'm saving up for the other things, so like a PlayStation 4, so I can get the uh, Arkham City. I think is it, no, not Arkham City. What is, what is that new one? Arkham Knight that's coming out. That's another Batman game. I have to get it. The Arkham City is free on PlayStation Plus this month. I, I downloaded it. I haven't played it yet. Oh, it is great. Not really a big comic book kind of guy, but the Batman games were pretty. My, my father-in-law let me borrow whatever the first one was, Asylum. Is that what it was? Yeah, Arkham Asylum? Yes. That was pretty neat. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm more of a Marvel guy, so like, but everybody loves Batman. So <laughs> uh, There's a lot of villains I didn't know about that I learned about just from playing that game, so... Yes, I found that Harley Quinn's pretty neat. I don't know anything about her, but she seems pretty cool. Yeah, she was actually a creation for the uh, animated series. Yeah, that she caught on so popularly that they actually started putting it in, into the comics. There you go. Which is pretty fun. Okay. Anyway. So, so yeah, I picked up a picked up a picked up another platinum that I nothing nothing terribly exciting, but it's still a platinum. I have no idea what you mean by a platinum. Platinum trophy. If you get all the, if you get all the trophies in a PlayStation game, you get a platinum trophy, which basically means you 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 can't do anymore. Ah. It's you know it's kind of like the ultimate goal, I guess, for for lack of a better lack of a better term. Yeah, I guess I could try to aim for stuff like that now that I can actually play online because, like, the Xbox, I can get as many uh, gamer points as possible, but a lot of the points were also, you know, doing things online, and I wasn't going to pay the extra fee to go gold over there to uh, to start actually earning those extra points. I just figured, okay, if I've managed to clear about everything that I can, then I'm happy. Yeah, I, I, uh, I got all the trophies in LEGO Lord of the Rings. I still need to get that one. That game is awesome. I love all the Lego. Well, okay, I didn't like the second Lego Indiana Jones, but that's for probably the most part, the, that's probably the worst one they've made. Yeah, I, I played the demo and I was like, this seems to be lacking. But all the other Lego ones, uh, I'm still missing the second Harry Potter one. Was uh, that was awesome too? Yeah, I love the first one. Uh, I don't think I've unlocked everything on that one yet. And then I, I want to get the Marvel one, obviously. You know, Marvel guy. I mean, heck, if you've listened to any of my podcasts, I you know. <laughs> That's where pretty much Disney now owns me because after they bought Star Wars and Marvel, I'm like, okay, you know. So you you like, are their uh, you are their servant now. Yes, which is why it's like you know Neverland wasn't meant to be a Disney podcast, but I keep pulling into things that are Disney things because you know so far I've done I I do like a regular news segment uh, where I try to cover entertainment and games and a lot of the entertainment stuff coming through right now that are kind of I'm calling it nerd news, but a lot of it is Marvel movies. 
So I'm like, well, that's actually Disney content. There's Star Wars news coming through, and, well, that's still Disney content. So the only thing that changes is when I'm like, okay, and today's special segment is He-Man. So that's when it changes gears. But other than that, it's like I feel like oh, I'm, I'm halfway a Disney podcast. I just don't think I have enough park visits at only having been there once uh, to really be able to get any good coverage or anything like that. So, yeah, Correct. Yeah, makes a big difference. But uh, I figure, you know, I'll just do a show on – things that I'm into, and it kind of works out. So, and Disney being one of them, and it kind of works out. You know, if, and if people don't like it, they have, they have options. They have options, yeah. So I'm slowly building the following up. There's people that I found out, you know, that are friends of mine that I didn't realize were listening to me that actually have, you know, sent comments on Facebook or whatever, and I'm like, oh, wait, you mean you're listening? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's good stuff, right? Yeah, so I'm thinking it's slowly building, so as long as people kind of keep sharing. I mean, I'm, I'm into, this is going to be actually on the 21st episode, and I got big plans for the week after. Uh, it's, uh, there's a thing called Free Comic Book Day I do every year, which is like the first Saturday in May. And uh, I'm going to have, of course, a quick segment on the 21st episode, but the 22nd episode, I'm just going to take a recorder with me to go to all the different comic shops and talk to some of the comic owners, you know, shop owners, different things. Uh, there's always this, this, there's this guy who's known as Darth Artist. Uh, he's actually a licensed Star Wars artist. He goes to a lot of conventions and draws a lot of different things, uh, does some horror conventions too. I've actually got, uh, he did a, 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 uh, Jedi Mickey drawing that, uh, I, was it last year or the year before or whatever? He was, he had, was kind of just handing out these colorized copies. I got that hanging on the wall. It's pretty cool. Nice. Uh, his name yeah, is one, that's one thing I never, never really got into, never really got into superheroes and comic books all that much. Oh, come to the dark side. We have cookies. <laughs> as long as you have beer. Well, I'm sure there is plenty. I'm not a drinker myself, but uh, I'm sure you'll find plenty. Fair enough. <laughs> but anyways, okay, so how I'm going to work this is uh, Philip wasn't going to be able to make it. Uh, he yeah. had just gotten home from, I guess he was been running around all day getting his car fixed and inspected, and he had to buy a suit because he's now serving as interim pastor in the church where I grew up, and so... Nice. He's he's working his tail feathers off. It's been a heck of a mess since his father was the pastor there, and since he passed away, they've had a hard time actually getting a solid pastor that didn't have something that was going really wrong. So they actually had to fire the last guy, which actually was a family friend, and so they called him to fill in as an interim until they find another pastor. And I told him, says, look, uh, you were called to be able to preach. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't call you to step up and lead this church. He's very capable, so... What's your what's your denomination? Uh, well, I don't know if we're still considered uh, considered like Southern Baptist and everything because you know you got the Southern Baptist Convention, but there's been like split offs, and I think we're still considered Southern Baptist. Okay, I think yeah, there's I'm, the American I'm, Baptist I'm, that jumped off, and yeah, I'm we're my Methodist. Yeah, but that's okay. We'll forgive you for being Methodist <laughs> as long as you're not Westboro Baptist. Oh no, Westboro is not actually a Baptist church. They use yeah, that no, name. They're they're, but, they're out of their minds. They are out of their minds. They're more of a cult and a bunch of lawyers, actually. It's a lawyer-run thing. They want someone to attack them so they have a chance, an excuse to sue them. Yep. They frequently show up around uh, the area, though, because they're you know they're just right over next door in Kansas. I'm here in Kansas City, which, yes, Kansas City is in Missouri. It's confusing, yes, but we're here in Missouri. Unless you're in the, unless you're in the Kansas City in Kansas. Yeah, but there's not that much of it over there. Most of once so, you get in Kansas, you'll hit over there's like Overland Park, uh, Lenexa, and Leewood, and everything. Uh, but not much Kansas City, Kansas. It's there's uh, still I think there's a little bit, little bit of suburban area, but mainly there's uh, some factories and stuff on the Kansas City, Kansas side. But most of the metro area is actually here on the Missouri side. We're just named after the wrong state. Imagine that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how it worked, but that's how it worked. <laughs> Okay. Um, All right, let's do it. Well, yeah, let's kind of get rolling here. Um, I've got here basically a list of songs, and uh, I've got backups in case we end up running into the same song. I'm going to write down all the songs we kind of go over. That way, when I go and record Philip on my recorder, I, you know, he can comment and add his comments of what he likes about that particular song, and nice. we'll go from there. Because I did write down some things I'm like that are like, yeah, these are going to be the obvious ones that pro somebody's going to mention. Uh, so I did write down. So I'm considering the honorable mentions. If, if you ever, you know, here on uh, Lou Angelo's show, frequently having honorable mentions because you know there's stuff that's going to be everybody's going to say it, but everybody's going to dodge it to try to get some new content. And of course, that's what I was aiming for. Okay, <clears throat> but the thing's already actually recording, so I'm just going to throw into a nice intro. 
All right, Neverlanders, for today's special content, uh, I like to kind of, of course, throw back to the nostalgia. And there's a lot of songs always when you're growing up or even as an adult that you've kind of, you know, it's always going to take you back and give you some sort of a memory. Uh, and so I'm going to actually focus on Disney because, let's face it, there's a lot of Disney songs and they all have some sort of memory for most of us, be that from a movie or maybe from a trip out to the parks or, you know, this could even be, you know, something, maybe you heard it on Radio Disney. I personally don't listen to Radio Disney, but I'm sure plenty of people do. You won't expect to hear me giving it on my list. But we are here with Tim Devine of TheMagicAndPixels.com. Say hello. Hello. How are you guys? Glad to be here. And uh, Tim is joining me to talk because he's a Disney guy. He's uh, He's got a great website where he's got all these really cool photos he's taken around Disney World and uh, even some Disneyland pictures. Uh a lot of different attractions. You can even buy prints of your photos, right? Yes, there is a store. It's currently under a little bit of red. red yeah. Let me try that again. You do edit this stuff, right? Uh, well, a little <laughs> bit. Uh, the editor I use is a music-based thing, so it wants to do everything by measure, so I can't be this perfectly precise. But <laughs> well, Apparently, it's my first day with my new teeth, so let me try this again. Okay. Um, I do have a store, yes. It's under a little bit of renovation right now, but... Uh, it'll be up and running fairly soon, and it should be a much nicer user experience than what used to be up there. Well, that's good. Uh, are you planning on at some point having, like, calendars to where, like, maybe somebody could go through and choose, oh, these are, like, 12 of my favorite pictures that you've done, and then they could order a calendar with those pictures for the months? That's actually a really cool idea. Um, I did a calendar a couple years ago. Um, the only problem with it, it was, it was a little cost prohibitive to do – a full bleed, full color, really nice product because I'm, I'm very particular about what I put out there yeah. either on the web or on print or anything like that. I'm, you know, I, I, uh, I really try to keep the quality as high as possible and it was, it was a little bit cost prohibitive, but if there was a way that somebody could say, Hey, I like these 12, make me something. If I could find a way to do it and logistically it would work. I, let's, let's give it a shot. Well, possible, uh, Vista print might be helpful with that. I actually did make a calendar off of some of my vacation photos, uh, and I just I basically had to pay a basic cost of Vistaprint, and I was able to pick uh, 12 of the photos, and you can actually choose what kind of finish. And so you could actually charge the amount of what it's going to cost for Vistaprint to make it and then add on however much you want to make as profit and as shipping. You might be able to get something to work out there because they actually did a pretty good job. Yeah, Vistaprint does have uh, pretty nice materials. I've used them before for a lot of my promotional type stuff, so... If there's a way to make it work logistically, then I'll never say no. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't recommend their T-shirt printing, though. It, it fades really fast. That it does. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to look for a different one because I need to get a, actually T-shirts for uh, Neverland here because I do plan on doing some special events, and I want people to be able to find me when I'm at this special event. So, Well, if you plan on driving to New Jersey, I'd be happy to recommend the, guy, uh, the company that I use, except uh, that might be a little bit of a drive for you. Yes, it would. Uh, if I was going to drive that far east, I would end up going south into Florida and go back to Disney World again. <laughs> Disney World, New Jersey. I mean, that's a that's a coin toss, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. I've never been to Jersey. I've been to New York, but I've never been to Jersey. So well, do do yourself the favor. Just skip it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm All on right. the I'm, I'm on the first plane out of town when I get a chance. <laughs> Well, as long as you're not near too many of those uh, Jersey Shore style people, that uh, yeah, them. <laughs> they they do not represent New Jersey. Thank goodness. And, and most of them aren't even from New Jersey. They're from like New York. They're <laughs> it's it, that's about as fraudulent as it gets. But we get painted with that brush, and it's uh it's it's, a, it's just a treasure to have to live down. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure because I, I would hate to have to say, oh, look, these people are supposed to be New Jersey people. No, we don't want to claim them. Yeah, you heard it on this podcast first, folks. Uh, the situation does not represent New Jersey. Yeah, I'm I'm glad for that because <laughs> that was frightening. <laughs> it, yes, I, I I got dumber every every minute I watched that show, and after about three minutes, I had to turn it off because my brain was ready to implode. I think the most I saw of it was uh, when Snooki was at WrestleMania, and I don't know why they had her at WrestleMania, <laughs> but she was at WrestleMania. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go hit the restroom until her match is over with. I'm not really sure why she shows up at anything. I although, know, yeah. although given the opportunity to trade paychecks with her, I probably wouldn't turn that down. But Right. If I could be famous uh, for doing nothing, I'd be on it. 
you'd be Paris Hilton. Sure. I, 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 you know, I think I could console myself with a bunch of people not liking me with all of that cash. It does make a great, uh, um, does make a great medicine, doesn't it? Oh yeah. Okay, but anyways, we digress for a lot here. Uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and name out the first song on your list because you are the guest, and it gives you a chance to maybe name in one of those songs that I'm going to say, yes, that's on my list too. Well, for full disclosure, I am a huge Disney park music fan. I actually have many, many, many gigabytes of park music on my computer and, by extension, my iPod. So... If I'm going to fire a track out your way, it's probably because I have it and I listen to it repeatedly. I'm going to go for leading off and playing center field here. I'm going to go with Zippity Doodah. Oh, yes. It, you got to love it. It's it's upbeat. It's, it's got a good rhythm to it. It, it, it gets you it, – it's a quintessential park song. Oh, yeah. Heck, I remember uh, as, as rare as that film is from, uh, I, I remember as a little kid actually seeing uh, just that clip. The only thing I remember of Song of the South when I was a little kid is him coming out singing Zippity Doo Dah with the birds coming out. And uh, then actually uh, the school system that I came out of here, the, the North Kansas City School District, we actually used to do a Song of the Month. And there was one month that Zippity Doo Dah was our song of the month. So we got to learn it and sing it every day in music class. It was great. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'll have it roll with it, man. Oh, yeah. And I think I do have a clip to be able to play right here, too. So that'll work. Let's if, do it. if you mention a song I don't have a clip of, I'm going to have to track it down. <laughs> I could probably send it to you if you need it. Yep. This one I have, I actually have a, uh, and it will be coming up in a future episode. I actually did find a, uh, a tape in a thrift store that has the entire story, uh, all the Br'er Rabbit stories from Song of the South, with all the songs. It's oh, really cool. wow. That's, that is really cool. I, I, I really wish Disney would come to their senses and, with the appropriate historical context, release Song of the South. Yep. Put that's some bonus material on there. Put some, Package it with some bonus material, presenting it in the context that it's supposed to be in. Mm-hmm. And get it out there. They would make a fortune off of that. Oh, yeah. If if you can go to the store and buy Blazing Saddles, <laughs> <laughs> why can't you get Song of the South? Exactly. Well, there are ways to get it if you know to go to the right uh, pirate location on uh, <laughs> the Internet. And I, uh, I may have, or may not have it. <laughs> I have a DVD of it that I just happen to have I don't know, appropriated. And it's, it's it's actually a really good movie. It's it is. It's got a nice. It's got a cute story to it. Um, it's it's got a moral and a message to it. Mm-hmm. And Uncle Remus is an awesome character that nobody even knows about. Yeah, and he, oh, he's brilliantly portrayed in that movie by that guy. And if I'm his name later, <laughs> if I'm and, and if I'm not mistaken, was he not the one of the first black actors, if not the first, to win an Oscar? Yes, or an uh, Award? Walt himself actually pushed for that as well, saying, "Hey, you guys got to, you know, I know this is kind of a regular, but you guys got to check this guy out." And you know, he really kind of leaned forward to to push that to say, "Hey, you got to check his performance; he's really good." And he apparently he, he was so impressed, you know. Although Walt was not big into doing sequels, he did want to use that actor again and maybe find some more Uncle Remus stories to be able to put out as some shorts. Apparently, you're looking for James Basket, by the way. James Basket. Okay. All right, but moving on to our next one. Um, now I kind of did like a, a mixed bag on how I wanted to go with this because there's more than one song in this movie that really always kind of gets me, and one of them's kind of more park related. But the main song, okay, every year there was like a tradition on, uh, at least on network television, back in the days when all you had was a, you know, a click, you know, by turning a knob, and you could watch maybe five total stations on the entire television. Every year there was something you could count on. You would always be able to find The Wizard of Oz, one specific, specific holiday every year, and also Dumbo. Dumbo was on every year, and I even had a little read-along book of Dumbo, and I can't help it. I hear Baby Mine, and I'm manhood goes right out the window. You're just going to, okay, I'm not going to cry, not this time. I'm going to hold it together. 
Uh, and my wife even uh, – Oh, she really b- bugs her because she likes – oh, I can't think of the guy's name now. Michael Crawford. Uh, on one of the DVD releases of Dumbo, I have two versions of Dumbo. I've got the, a, a DVD release uh, from a, a previous anniversary and then a more recent uh, Blu-ray release. But on the old DVD release, they actually had Michael Crawford singing Baby Mine as a special feature based from an album of Disney songs apparently he released. And even with him doing it, it's just – oh. <laughs> You get the vapors. The first time that song really hit me was the first time we went to Disneyland and saw Magical. And it was and and the reason I say it is because I was a fairly new father. The song really had no emotional impact on me at all up to that point. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, bam, manhood on the ground. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm with you on that one. Good call. Oh, yeah. See, the other alternative was I have noticed whenever I hear the audio from a park of the Casey Jr. ride, it kind of brings back some of those memories when I hear the Casey Jr. song. But of the two, picking something from Dumbo, I had to go baby mine. Good call. The Casey oh, yeah. Jr. is a better ride than Dumbo, but... Probably is. I haven't ridden either one of them, unfortunately. Oh, man. Uh, I'm one of these rare Walt Disney World fans that would go to Disneyland Every chance I got, I just I love that place. That's on my list. I'm gonna because I've been to Walt Disney World. My wife has never been to Walt Disney World, but I've never been over to Disneyland. If you could, if you could dig up Disneyland and drop it on the same piece of property that the Magic Kingdom stands on, I I'd probably lose my job because I'd never leave. <laughs> uh, Disneyland Park is absolutely amazing. For it's exactly the same and completely different at the same time. And you have the little, and you have the little added bonus that, like, you know, that Walt guy used to walk there. Exactly, that's what I was about to say. Plus, that's where Walt actually was. You know, just a little, little, little slight bonus. I mean, you could be sitting on a chair or a bench that, you know, for all we know, Walt Disney may have sat on it. <laughs> and you can, you can feel his vibe when you walk in the place. It's really weird. If you, you have to, you have to kind of be a Kool Aid drinker to to feel it. But I'm a Kool Aid drinker, and when I walk in there, you, the, the spirit of Walt is there. You can, you can feel it. Oh, yeah, I, I'm going to get out there eventually. You got to do it, brother. I would love, actually, uh, we have a local theme park here in Kansas City that uh, there's always this rumor that flies around that Worlds of Fun is eventually going to be bought by Disney and turned into a Disney park. I would love for that to happen, but that rumor has flown around for so many years, and right now it's in the ownership of, uh, what, Cedar Fair or Cedar Point, whatever they call themselves, and they put all their money out into an Osprey Farm on the coast and really let – our park actually fall to pieces. It used to be own, owned by a Hunt Midwest. It was also Leo Mar Hunt, owner of the Chiefs. And so there was money being put in. It was a great park growing up, but it's just really fallen because these, these owners are more concerned about competing with Disney. And right here in the Midwest, they don't really have that competition. So they kind of meh, so-so. Yeah, but you have Andy Reid now, so there you go. We – well, actually, he was an improvement. We'll, we'll take him over, you know. But, yeah, the Chiefs are even under different ownership now. We, I miss kind of the Hunt com- family and company and everything. <sighs> but, oh, it would be awesome. Now, I've heard Marceline, is, you know, at one point was going to have a park built, but Walt passed away before he actually got things approved to be able to move forward. But uh, if you ever go – if you ever travel into Marceline, Missouri, uh, they have this thing, Toon Fest, which I will be going to and recording for the show. There were plans I saw in the museum there that they do want to try to build some semblance of an expanded Main Street because you, you can find the real Main Street that Walt you know was kind of basing Main Street off of there. But they there seems there I don't know what all the details of the project, but it almost seems like they want to try to build a park themselves or something. I would love it. They would give an excuse. It's it's only about a three hour drive. I I could make that frequently. I think that would be a neat little uh, little venture, you know, just something to do just to say you did it. Yeah. You know, even 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 if they don't build up Marceline, if they just if, if they just you know build a little small tribute to them, you know, I'd go check it out just to cross it off the bucket list. You know, I'm I'm as I'm more of a fan of Walt and his parks than I am even the movies, if that makes any sense. I mean, I'm sure that's a sacrilege to the Disney diehards, but no, I think you're not alone. I'm pretty sure Paul Barry's that way too. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Barry's a very good buddy of mine, and I uh, I don't get to see him as often as I like, but he is a he's a great guy, and I'm proud to consider him a friend. 
Yeah, he seems like a really good guy. I haven't gotten a chance to meet him yet, but I'm figuring, you know, if I ever get to Disneyland, I'm going to make sure I try to get to that Trader Sam's meet he does. He's Paul's a, Paul's a cool dude, and the funny thing is if you're talking to him over a beer or you're listening to his podcast, the voice is exactly the same. <laughs> Even that slow way to talk. <laughs> 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 Paul, Paul, Paul is good people, and uh, we were hoping to go out to Disneyland this summer, um, pay a visit to some family, and check out the California scenes. We haven't been out there in a few years, and I don't think it's going to happen this year, but next year for sure, and Paul and I are already planning on hooking up and hanging out together. Awesome sauce. At one point, I would love to be able to get him on the show to be able to talk about growing up near a Disney park and going there, and you know, because since my show is all about nostalgia, having somebody with that experience would be awesome. So, I will work on that. He's a good. He's a good dude, and he's a. He's got a lot of good information. That'd be a fun show. I'd absolutely yeah. listen, listen to that one. Oh yeah, I, I I would have too much fun with that too. Okay, but moving on because yeah, I can babble and I can get way off topic if you let me. Um, let's see. We just what did we just do? Baby mine. We did zippity doo and baby mine. Oh, so and you're up. I am up and ready to knock one out of the park, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go eclectic on you here. Okay. The World Showcase Area Loop. Okay. It's got it's got it's got a just a, a track you know random track from all the different countries and it just kind of splices together. It plays for about about an hour hour and change, and I love it. I love it. I love the culture of it. I love the different kind of kinds of music of it. It it evokes a memory of just walking around the promenade past the country, smelling the foods and seeing the sights. And it's a really awesome time killer when you're driving in the car. Yeah. It's, it's an hour long then. Sure. And it's, it's just, it's got a great sound to it. I mean, you, I guess you have to listen to it to really, to really get it, but it's, it's a good track and it's very enjoyable. Yeah. Well, prepare for the punishment on me. I've the, on the one trip that I had down to Walt Disney World, we did a day where we split it between going to Animal Kingdom in the morning and and big chunk of the afternoon, and then we tried to do Epcot kind of later in the evening, and our feet were killing us, and we were so tired that we managed to get on like a couple of rides at Epcot, and I think we got as far around as Maelstrom, and then we left, and we didn't get back. So I really didn't get a chance to experience the whole World Showcase, and I really didn't know what I had missed, and we didn't even manage to ride Soarin' because we didn't realize it was there. But I find out all the stuff I missed now by listening to Disney podcasts. I'm like, oh, what was I thinking? Epcot's got so much stuff. <laughs> Epcot will kill your feet if you give it a chance, though. Oh, yeah. But the park is awesome. I mean, I could I could really go there, spend an entire day, just walk around taking pictures because, you know, it's kind of like what I do. And not go on a single ride and just have a, and still have a good time. I could just. Enjoy the sights, listen to the music, you know, check out a couple of the bands that play around World Showcase, check out some of the offerings that they have in Future World, and I'd, I'd be a happy guy. <sighs> That's definitely on my to-do list. You gotta, you gotta budget yourself some time for it, though, and you have to pace yourself, otherwise you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna get, you're gonna get creamed. I think next time around I'm going to, like, get in super really good shape and save up enough money to where I have at least four, maybe five days to spend over there in Walt Disney World so I can at least devote an entire day to each park and build up enough endurance to where I can take it. You're going to you're, you're going to you're going to need it. Now, my wife and I having made more trips than we can possibly count, we've gotten down to walking through the parks, pushing three two three strollers. Yeah, you know, we're we're veterans. <laughs> Yeah, I also have to plan to somehow or another squeeze in a chance to go over to SeaWorld to make my wife happy, the biology teacher, and then I got to go to Universal because there's a Spider-Man ride and Harry Potter all over the place. This past trip in November when we were down there is the first time and the only time I've ever been to Universal. We went to Islands of Adventure because I really wanted to see the Harry Potter land, and I've got a couple buddies that work there, and they invited us over for the day and uh, treated us really well, and holy smokes was that good. Yeah, I have some friends that just managed to get out there, uh, I guess, in October. And I've looked at some of the photos. I'm like, oh, gosh, i got to go. I'm, the I, Harry I've got Potter. their video. I haven't edited it together, uh, a copy of it yet, uh, because they, they borrowed my camera and everything. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting a chance to actually edit that video together, too. <laughs> just so the Harry look. Potter ride inside of Hogwarts Castle is the greatest theme park ride I have ever, ever been on. Oh, goodness. And Disney can't touch that one. 
Oh, but I wish they would. <laughs> I wish they would, but yeah. they ha- they Something haven't even Star come Wars close. could compete with that if they did it right. <sighs> well, I-, I like to like, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's ever said this, but the Harry Potter ride, it's like a mashup of Soren meets Peter Pan meets some of all thrills, if that makes any sense. I'm sure and, it does. <laughs> and it is just, it is just so awesome. I, I couldn't believe how good it was. And, Universal's laid down the gauntlet now. I mean, they've they've put the chips on the table and said, you know, beat this. Yeah, they have. It's it's, it's now a park that I, I I definitely have to make sure I visit at some point in my life as well. One of these I'm, days, I'm, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> and and, I, and I'm a, I'm a Di- and I'm a Disney guy. Saying this is is how just wonderful that attraction is. It's oh my gosh. Well, and you, you could, I mean, heck, the queue line alone. You're walking through Hogwarts Castle. It's a f- fully fleshed out castle with. You go past Dumbledore's office, and the paintings are talking to each other, and the safety spiels rattled off to you by an animatronic sort, sorting hat. And oh man, oh. my my uh, my my hidden Harry Potter geek like came out on full display on that one. <laughs> I would pre- probably be worse being me. I'm, I'm I, I don't mind geeking out on over everything. If, if, in case you can't tell, I really liked it. <laughs> the nice thing is, is here at the Neverland Podcast, you can talk about it all you want. Nice. Let's go. We, we're not held to the Disney constraint. Okay, but trying to keep us moving, because uh, you're like me. You just love talking about stuff you get into. Um, all right, now, probably I have to refer to this. And okay, now, of course, growing up, I'm, I'm still going to refer to, like, movies. I've got more experience with movies than I do parks. But, uh, you know, growing up, you, I had seen, you know, a few of the classic films, of the Disney films. I really loved them, loved Mary Poppins. But I think the one that really was that turning point that started really turning me into a Disney geek was The Little Mermaid. Well, that, the 90s revolution kind of began. And uh, the, the thing that kind of stuck out with me, after I was, had watched the movie, I always had in my head the bit there uh, – where Ariel is, is singing as her voice is taken away. That tune just got stuck in my head and stuck in my head. And then when I got a copy of the soundtrack from my buddy Phil, I realized, oh, wait a minute, that's the melody of Part of Your World. And that song is still, it's Jody Benson's voice, the way she sings and everything. It's just brilliant, and that has got to be on the list. Good call. That for me, was like it was like a turning point song of like, oh, my gosh, this is the kind of stuff I've got to watch all the time. So... Now, some of the 90s films, not so great, but most of them were just brilliant. Absolutely. And part of your world is like that turning point to me where it's just like, oh, man, I got to – you know, that was the point that I started making sure I went to the theater to watch Disney movies, not just renting videotapes. I'm with you. Little, I mean, how do you go wrong with The Little Mermaid? I mean, it's, it's a classic Disney renaissance movie. Oh, yeah. And actually, the favorite Disney princess of mine because she was the first Disney princess – that I remember that actually was funny. Because you go back, you know, you know, Cinderella's kind of interesting. You know, Snow White's kind of got this kind of personality. But finally, Ariel was a princess with personality and was hilarious, especially when she couldn't talk and all the crazy pantomime stuff they came with. I was cracking up. Absolutely. It's, and she was a deviation from the typical damsel in distress. I'm helpless. Hey, I need some man to come save me because I just can't function or whatever. And yep. she yeah. was different. Because she was different because she wanted to fall in love with her dude instead of just having bad happening to her. She actually sort of caused it to happen to yeah. her. And it <laughs> she she made her own mess. Big and time. It, it, Kind of sort of worked out in the end, I do believe. Yeah, at least in the Disney version. Uh, if you if you ever want to read the Hans Christian Andersen version, not quite as nice. <laughs> Are you saying Disney tends to sanitize and make things nicey nice? Give you a happy ending at least. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mind that. Now, of course, Pocahontas. It kind of bothered me what they did with that. But uh, yeah, we can skip over that movie. I, you know, I, I tend to. <laughs> It's not one of it's, – it's good. It's not one of my favorites. It's so preachy. But, the first time I saw it, I was like, well, that was not bad. Then I saw it a second time like, oh, my gosh. I feel like I've, had, I've been beaten over the head with some kind of weird message. Pocahontas 2, a.k.a. Avatar. <laughs> a.k.a. I didn't watch that one. <laughs> a.k.a. I fell asleep an hour into the Blu-ray and haven't gone back. <laughs> well, I haven't seen Avatar yet either because I heard, oh, look, Dancing with Wolves, only with Smurfs. 
<laughs> and they're blue and look like giraffes. <laughs> yep. I, I couldn't I, I couldn't quite figure it out, so I, I think my brain just said, all right, it's time to take a little nap. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably have to go back to it at some point, but well, it's, yeah. not, it's not, the, not the top of my list. When they open up the Pandora land, you'll just have to check it out and then say, oh, well, maybe I could stomach this, maybe. So, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. All right, so next on your list. <laughs> you kind of hit the uh, – hit where I was going to go. Um, I am Emmy. Huge Mary Poppins fan. Oh, yeah. It is probably my favorite Disney movie out of all of them with Darby O'Gill and the little people playing a very close second. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I like to – I tend to drift a lo- drift aside from the mainstream a little bit. Um, but between Darby O'Gill and Mary Poppins, I, mean, I don't think you can really go wrong either way. Um, but how do you narrow down one song from Mary Poppins? It's almost impossible because the entire soundtrack is amazing. Yeah. But there is I'm one song that comes to mind, I'm sure. <laughs> it's the word you use when you don't know what to say. And what word might that be? Super <laughs> Yep, I don't even know how to spell it, so I'm writing it down on the list, and I'm just going to say super <laughs> Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It starts with an S. <laughs> and then a whole bunch, and then a whole bunch of other letters. Yeah, crooked letter, humpback, uh, humpback eye, and all that kind of thing. It starts with super, so if we get that far. <laughs> we, we but it's, it. it's just a, it, it's just a cool song, and the fact that they made up a word that absurd. Oh yeah, and then wrapped an entire song around it and gave it an awesome beat, and even and made it, the, and then animated it with live action. Oh yeah, it, it's it's like. I, whatever whatever was in the water that day, I would love to have a sip of because that was really good stuff. Yeah, when they invent water that makes you brilliant, I'd tell you what, somebody's going to be rich. Yeah, I'd probably stop drinking so much Pepsi at that point. <laughs> yeah. So I could, I could actually keep on that same vein for something I wrote down that I was thinking, well, that would be kind of an honorable mention because there's, there's an obvious song really and I'm surprised you didn't go with, but you were probably also thinking everybody would think this song. But it's not actually next on my list, but there is one coming that I kind of thought, oh, well, that's going to be an obvious. But anyways, I'll move on to the next on my list here. Hmm, you, you, have, you, you, have my, you, have the little, you have the little hamster wheel of my brain spinning. Oh, well, I'll go ahead and jump to my, my, my Mary Poppins song, Feed the Birds. Okay, it's obvious. I know. It is like the Walt favorite song, but I the main part of that song, and I think the, the main memory I would always get when I was a kid is not necessarily the lyrics or the meaning of the song, but the bridge, uh, the bridge music. The da, 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 I don't know, but that's just beautiful music. It sure is, and I think the uh, Sherman, the Sherman brothers, outdid themselves on that uh, oh, yeah. that whole thing. I mean, that's quintessential. I know I've used that word a few times, but it's a good they, word. They they nailed it. I mean, you know. And I completely when I found out later, you know, as an adult, I started understanding the meaning of the song. I'm like, oh, this is so deep. And then through you know listening to Disney podcasts, finding out the story of how well, that was Walt's favorite song and how he used to go and at the end of the day and go and call the Shermans over and say, hey, play the song. And knowing that that was the song, and it made it that much more special when I was watching Saving Mr. Banks, knowing about that, and when they played that song and having, you know, Tom Hanks as Walt Disney, just just embodying Walt Disney, when he'd come in and was just listening to that, I was like, okay, don't tear up, don't tear up, don't tear up. Uh, just that song becomes even more special when you realize how special it was to Walt because you're like, oh, I totally get that. Would, would you believe I haven't seen Saving Mr. Banks yet? Oh my goodness! Such it's on my list. Movie. It is on my list, especially like as I've already alluded to. I'm a huge Walt Disney and Mary Poppins fan, so you'd kind of wonder what am I waiting for? But I need to get on that. Yeah, you have to be prepared for a drama because it is a drama, but so good. Not not 100 percent accurate, but such a great movie, and it's really opened up the floodgates. Now I've I've noticed there's a lot of indie films coming out. Uh, there's one that actually even the, the thank you Walt Disney dot org is actually involved in making. Uh, God, there's so many of them now that I can't even think of the names of these. There's at least two more that they, they even have Facebook pages. One I think is going to wind up straight to DVD because the budget was so low. Uh, there's another one that actually has um, – uh, oh, I can't think of his name. Napoleon Dynamite for a lack of better terms. He is actually playing Roy Disney 
in a book that's based off of a biography called Walt Before Mickey, which deals with all of the his years here in Kansas City. Now, it's being currently filmed in Florida, and they're building things to kind of look like Kansas City, but I, of course, was thinking, look, Kansas City's right here. Why don't you come film it here where it actually happened? So I'm excited about that one, and I cannot think of the name of the other film that actually their Facebook page that says that their DVD is ready. You could pre-order it right now. But it's like now that it's like the, they've opened the gates to say, oh, it's okay to portray Walt in a movie. So, you know, now we can do it. Fair enough. I look forward to seeing it. I'd actually like to read some of the books, you know, that these are based off of because, you know, I'm learning so much more about Walt's history being, you know, that I've every year now for the past, oh, four years now, I've made the trip to Marceline where they do Toon Fest and they have this great hometown museum where you get to learn, you know, a little bit about the town, but a lot about the Disney family. Oh, my gosh. It's the same museum pretty much every year with a few additions, but I still got to go through it every year. And I sit and they, they show the documentary, uh, The Man, the Myth, the Legend, or whatever, something like that. Oh, yeah, Walt, the Man Behind the Myth. Yes, that one. I have the I have the DVD of it, and oh, my gosh, was that well done. It was oh, very God. enjoyable. I want to get a copy of that, but I've never found one. <laughs> I will it's, one day. Uh, Amazon is your friend. Ah, not in Missouri they aren't, uh, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, I actually they have, got, they have issues I, with our internet tax law that got passed, and so they could actually cut off all of us, like me, who was an affiliate with Amazon, which is why on NeverlandPodcast.com you will not find any Amazon selling links because they shut it off and they won't let me sell any of their products. So I figure if you won't let me sell because you're mad at my state, I will not purchase any items from you either. Fair enough. But if you really why are they feel the, that on us? But if you absolutely feel the need to buy something from Amazon, you can always go to TheMagicAndPixels.com because I do have one of those. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, I actually bought that movie uh, on Main Street USA in Walt Disney World a couple years ago. Oh, wow. um, pr- probably a couple more, probably more than a couple years ago. But um, it just kind of called out to me, and I know the prices are way inflated, and you know, I probably could have gotten it cheaper. But I wanted it. I wanted it right then and there, and I wanted to go back to the hotel room that night and watch it. And it, I couldn't believe how good it was. It was amazing. Oh yeah, and especially I love that it's hosted by Dick Van Dyke. I just love that guy. He's a pretty talented guy. Oh yeah, I'll be so I'll, I will probably cry when he actually passes away. <laughs> you know, sort of like it, the, it would be a loss for the world. Hmm? Oh yeah, I can I can imagine you being a little upset about Stanley. Oh yeah, he's he's almost been like a father to my childhood. <laughs> he is Have like you, the Walt Disney of comic books. So, but since you and since you and I are both major video game geeks. Have you played Lego Marvel Super Heroes yet? I played the demo. It's awesome. I need to get it. Have you seen all the ca- – did, did they have a Stan Lee cameo in the demo? Uh, I'm trying to think. I only went through the thing once. Well, without completely ruining for you, I do believe there's a Stan Lee hidden in almost every level as one of the uh, one of the findable objects. Oh, and please tell me he's playable. I My kid's been playing it. I haven't gotten it to it yet because uh, I've been playing all the other Lego games, but – it's 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 on my to do list that once I find any time at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. You work in law enforcement. My stepbrother's in law enforcement. There is no time. <laughs> work, working the job, running the website, mm-hmm. being being a daddy and a husband and a baseball coach and all that good stuff. And yeah, time time is time is very finite. I learn that more and more every year. Oh yeah. But back to the music. Back to the music. All right. Back to the music. Next on your list. Oh, man. It's such a hard list because there's so many good songs. Oh, yeah. Um, I had to think about it for a week before I made my list. So. <laughs> well, thanks th- th- thanks for the 10 minutes of heads up. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I am going to go and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a tip of the hat to Disney's California Adventure and my buddy Paul Barry. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Love yeah, you, buddy. I don't think he listens to me, though, unfortunately. <laughs> well, he, he, he's, he's listening in spirit. Um, a tip of the hat and a, and a nod to Aladdin, a musical spectacular at Disney's California Adventure for, for, making, me, for making me realize that Aladdin is one of my favorite Disney movies that I never even knew I liked. The music in that movie is incredible from friend like me to the Prince Ali song to a whole new world. They're, they're just song after song. They're just, they're, they're great. Yeah. 
if I had to pick one, and I only get to pick one, yep. I'm going friend like me. Oh yeah, because Robin Williams just he 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 hit a he hit it into the upper deck on that one. Yeah, I didn't even know he could sing until that song. <laughs> it was pretty darn good. Oh yeah, and I don't I it, I really don't even think it needs any, it doesn't even need any explaining or any justification. It's just an awesome song. Yeah, and it's it's toe tapping good, and it has it's it'll make you laugh while you're watching it. So it's like the first time you see the movie, you can't follow it because you're too busy kind of laughing at some of the antics and some of the things they've animated. That is not till like the I don't know tenth time that you watch it, you're able to just sit down, and listen to the song, and say this is just a cool song. Absolutely, and when you get to California Adventure, if you've never seen the Latin music the musical spectacular in DCA. You absolutely have to see it. It is the best Disney live action stage show in any park, hands down. I challenge you and defy you to argue with me on it. I'm adding it to the list of must do. It is awesome. It's about 40 minutes, give or take. Um, the friend like me sequence is Broadway on steroids. I can't believe they had all that equipment and theming and you know stage material ready to go that quick and it's just really really good and the genie has about three or four parts where he gets to ad lib oh. and, and some of his cracks are current and topical cool it's the same general spiel it's the same joke but he can ad lib in you know he'll, he'll ad lib in a kim kardashian joke or he'll ad lib in a Lindsay lohan or whoever the Whoever the Hollywood flunky du jour is. And, and, and there's, there's, like I said, there's three or four different spots that they work it in. And it's literally split your sides funny because you don't know it's coming. I wonder how much of that will be integrated because they're, they've developed a full Broadway version of Aladdin. I don't know when it's supposed to open. Or it might already be open as far as I know, but I kind of wonder how much they were able to integrate in from that stage version when they can actually stretch it out and spend more time on it. And maybe even develop some of the characters a little more. Yeah, I gotta get to New York City one of these years and see some of these shows. Remember, I'm only about two hours away. My wife's from New York City. My my father in law lives very very close to New York City. I really don't have an excuse other than I just haven't gone because between Aladdin and Mary Poppins, I'd love to see them both. Yeah. The Lion King, I could have taken her. Li- I could have taken her left. I'm not the biggest Lion King fan in the world. But Aladdin and Mary Poppins, they would they would have me at hello. Yeah, uh, those are two that I haven't seen. The one, and actually, good transition here. The one of the Broadway musicals that I did manage to see, and I've seen it, uh, I think, three different times now. Once actually at a, uh, uh, we, we call it Starlight Theater here in Kansas City. They basically do Broadway-style shows over the summer in an outdoor theater. Uh, then I've seen a homeschool group perform this. And then I've also seen it done in like a theater in the park thing where just here in Gladstone, I'm in a suburb of Kansas City where they've performed it. And actually, the homeschool group did better than the Gladstone area. But it's Beauty and the Beast. Fantastically translated onto Broadway. And there's actually a song in here that was not in the movie that I really wish when they did the kind of the re-release there and they added in uh, the new song Human Again in there. I really wish they would have had this song in there because it really fleshes out the character of the Beast. It's a song called If I Can't Love Her. And it's got even a reprise in there. But it, it fleshes out, you know, you've, you've got single lines in the film where they talk about him falling into a kind of a depression and despair over the years. But this is a song that kind of, uh, it happens right after he's chased Belle out of the West Wing. And he just like, in, in the regret of, oh, what did I just do? He just kind of goes into this depression. It's this really great song. It's like, you know, I, basically it's kind of like I'm dooming myself if I can't learn how to love her. And if I can't learn to love her, you know, just let the world be done with me. So it's like this suicidal kind of song. And it, it kind of really sets it off as kind of the finale of the, of the uh, well, I don't know if you would call it, you know, end of second act or whatever. But it's right before the intermission. Uh, so then you get this intermission and it comes back, of course, with the wolf chase. And then, of course, later with the reprise, after he's let Belle go, they reprise this song. And it's If She Can't Love Me. And it kind of turns around, but it is still back to that despair of like, well, I've learned how to love now, but I have to win her love back. Apparently I didn't because she's so willing to leave, and she probably will never come back again. But it's just this great song, and I don't know if you've ever seen the Broadway version of Beauty and the Beast. I, I have not, but you, now, you, now you, I mean, you have another one on my list now that I need to uh, 
go take care of. So now, I'll, now I need even more time and more, a couple more bucks. But I got to start knocking some of these things out, man. Yeah, because I think it's only strictly touring now. But you might even find a local high school doing it. I did. There was a high school here in the area that did it a couple years ago, but I didn't get a chance to get out there to see it. So, you know, I don't know if the high school could do it with the the quality of the Broadway style cast, but it's such a good show, and that's. That is pretty much like nearly my all-time favorite Disney movie, is Beauty and the Beast. That was brilliant. I mean, as much as Silence of the Lamb was intriguing, I really think Beauty and the Beast should have won Best Picture that year. But, you know, I'm not on the Academy, so who do I know? Well, and if I was on the Academy, L.A. Confidential would have won Best Picture, but that movie about the boat sinking kind of had yeah. a little bit more hype behind it. Yeah, although Titanic was good the first time. The second time, I was like, okay, can we sink this thing already? It was a lot more entertaining when it started being, oh, now it's dangerous. So, <laughs> Well, my whole theory on Titanic, and I'll make this short so we can get back to the music, but the first hour and a half was a sappy chick flick, and the second half, you watched thousands of people just drown and freeze to death. Yeah, and it became this, like, and you knew thing. it was, And you knew it was going to happen. Yeah. Because I was in college when that movie came out. I remember all these girls in the, in the classes going, oh, don't tell me what happens. Don't tell me what happens. I'm like, well, here's a clue. The boat goes down. <laughs> exactly. It's not going to end well. <laughs> exactly. Now, 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 what time's LA Confidential playing? Because that's, <laughs> I love that movie. You know, I don't believe I've seen that. Oh my gosh. If you, if you like good detective dramas and, and, and you know, it's, it's a period piece. It's got the noir thing going on. It's got an, it's got an incredible ensemble cast with Russell Crowe and Danny DeVito and James Cromwell, Kim Basinger, Guy Pierce. You, you, you name it. They're, they're all in it. And it's just an, um, Kevin Spacey. It's, that's an awesome movie. How did I miss this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either because that does sound cool. It's awesome. I mean, it's like a two and a half hour movie that blows by. It's really, really good. Good cast, at least. Wow. Yeah, man, you ain't kidding. All right. Well, moving on. What is your next on your list? <laughs> I'm going to go back to Epcot again. Of course. And I'm going to go with the. Illuminations Fireworks Spectacular. Oh, yes, I've heard that. Whew. But I'm going to plus it, and I'm going to put the holiday tag on the end of it. From around Thanksgiving-ish through New Year's, they add an extra three-and-a-half to four-minute musical tag on the end of it, basically narrated by Walter Cronkite. Wow. Sung to the tune of Let There Be Peace on Earth. Hmm. And I think the finale, they blow off more fireworks in in the couple second finale than they do in almost the entire show up to that point. To the point where the ground actually shakes. Wow. And and the Let There Be Peace on Earth has it has like a choir type sound to it. And it's it, it definitely has it has an emotional kick to it. Um, part of the reason I love it so much is I like Illuminations. It's one of my favorite fireworks shows. I, I like it more than the Magic Kingdom fireworks. Um, but the Let There Be Peace on Earth, that was my grandmother's favorite song. And she's been gone for 13 and cha- 13 years and change now. And it's, it's a couple minute reminder that she's still here with us in spirit. There's, there is a bigger picture out there and it's an op, it's an optimistic, hopeful song that the world can become a better place and then they just almost knock you down with the fireworks at the very end so i mean the whole if you take the whole thing as a package it's going to be it's it's hard to it's hard to not love it all right adding that to my to-do list (laughs) because i've always wanted to go and check out the place around christmas anyway i'm thinking okay and i i did not know that illuminations was this big thing when i was down there there's so much if i'd have known then, back in 2009, when I went, uh-oh, internet connection problem. Hold on. They're trying to fix it. Uh-oh. Okay. Okay, now i got to give it a little bit of time to make sure the recording gets good and started. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Don't know what it had. Suddenly said in, but the internet got interrupted, and I was like, uh-oh, I hope that's not something on my end. Nah, it was all mine. Somebody, I'm, I'm using Skype on my phone, and somebody, somebody blew in, and <laughs> somebody blew in on on an incoming call and blew me right on out. Oh no. Okay, all right. So we just finished with Illuminations with the holiday tag. 
Uh, illuminations in general, but the holiday tag for the for the absolute win. Yeah, and I think I just said that that's definitely on my to-do list because I – oh, yeah. I, I remember what I was saying. I was saying uh, in 2009 when I was on my trip, if I had had any idea what the fireworks shows actually were like, I would have made sure I saw them all because I just thought, oh, well, they're going to shoot off fireworks. So I can probably just see them from wherever in the park, and it wasn't until later that I've learned, oh, my gosh, they do these this music and this whole thing. And then I found out about Epcot having the Illumination show. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I missed all this stuff. So I have to go back now to see what I missed. It's like they plan it to get you to come back. Exactly. Okay, well, moving on to the next thing on the list because you know, I'm going to have to do some cutting down because this is going to be over an hour here at the rate we're going just for the, the main section here. Uh, but I wanted to do something a little bit different as far as it's still movie-related here. But I wanted to go into some scoring here. Uh, Hans Zimmer, which at the time I had not heard of this guy, and I, you know, at when I was in my teens, because I was playing in marching band and concert band, I used to play trumpet. I wasn't very good at it, but I played it. Uh, I had kind of a, and I still do have a taste for that kind of, uh, you know, instrumental and scoring type of music. Uh, not really into the classics, but uh, to me, a lot of the, the modern guys who are composing for film are like those classic composers, except for they're more telling more of a story because they have a story going on on screen and they're using music to help also tell that story. But Hans Zimmer did the scoring to The Lion King. And if I was going to be specific, uh, the, there's this main theme that goes on The Lion King. Like, uh, there's, I don't remember, I recall one scene where you're kind of, it's kind of just showing kind of the plains and some of the, the uh, well, geography or whatever, the landscapes, and how this rain kind of sweeps through. And it's also the same theme that kind of jumps up when Simba is stepping up that rock. And climbing up there, that big main theme comes out there. Just always, I don't know, it just kind of reaches into your soul and just brings you up and just brings, ah, you know. I can't explain it any better than that. <laughs> you know, I thought you were going to go in a different direction with Hans Zimmer. I don't know which other direction to go other than I know he did Amazing Spider-Man 2, so I'm looking forward to what he did. Although James Horner did the first one, and I kind of like James Horner better, but that's another story. <laughs> I do believe Hans Zimmer was involved in a fairly obscure movie known as Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes, he was. Yeah, I mean, it, it never, Yeah, I guess it really didn't catch on and, you know, it just wasn't really that popular and all, but... <laughs> Only some guy named Johnny Depp that everybody now seems to think he's the greatest thing since uh, uh, John Wayne or something, I don't know. <laughs> the greatest thing since 21 Jump Street. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's where I thought you were going to go, and oh, I was no. I was ready to agree with you 100 percent because I the the scoring for Pirates of the Caribbean all the movies is incredible. Yeah, I got to say that it's pretty good. I didn't buy any of those soundtracks, but the main theme of it it does have that great feel to it. So, yeah, but yeah, it's it's, it's still to me it's not like the the Lion King that has that big pole that just kind of lifts you out of your seat and everything. But yeah, Hans Zimmer's work is really really good, and even. Uh, you know, because I can go and be obscure and away from Disney on this show. Uh, he even partnered, I forgot who the other guy was, but uh, him and another guy actually did the scoring for the three most recent Batman films. Mainly because Hans Zimmer could give it that emotional push and this other guy could give it that, that drumming action kind of tone. So the two of them together uh, puts together this really, really actually great score for those as well. Very memorable. He's got a he's got a good body of work. He's not quite there as far as John Williams goes, but he's making his way quickly. Yeah. Well, who can really replace John Williams? I mean, that's John Williams. Yeah, John John Williams is the litmus test for composing um, theatrical scores. There's oh my gosh, that that could be a show in and of itself right there. And it probably will be at one point. <laughs> All right. Well, let's. I'll probably let's even follow up with a Danny Elfman show, and then maybe even a Jerry Goldsmith show. <laughs> Put it, put it to this way. If you get made fun of on Family Guy, you know you made it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So like when Weird Al does a parody of one of your songs, you know you're a hit band. Would you believe I actually went to a Weird Al concert? I would love to have gone to one. I have. I keep missing every year. There's always something that happens and I can't go. I don't know what I watched more, though. Him performing or the people in the audience. <laughs> they're a different breed. <laughs> I can imagine. There, there was a guy, and all, there was a guy, two seats or three seats down from me. We saw a buddy of mine saw him in one of the casinos at, in Atlantic City. Guy was about two or three seats down, 
And I thought this guy was going to lose his mind emotionally because his hero, Weird Al, was on stage. <laughs> you would have thought this guy was in the presence of greatness. Like the Lord himself came back to Earth just to see this guy. <laughs> It was, it was hilarious. Oh my gosh! So now I have to go just to see if anybody's going to have that experience. You know the way people dress up and I guess I guess you call it cosplay. Like they'll dress up as a stormtrooper to go see Star Wars. Not that I've never done that. No, this yeah. guy I was, was Barney Rubble with the Flintstones movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It hadn't been my idea originally, but it was my buddy Phil's idea. He was dressed as Fred Flintstone. I was dressed as Barney Rubble. Uh, his, I think it was his aunt had made these costumes for us. We thought, you know what? This will be fun. Let's do it. So, yeah. did, did you have, did you have Betty and Wilma with you? Unfortunately, no. It's kind of funny when you dress as Fred and Barney. It, it's hard to get a couple of girls to go along with you. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to say it, but. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I can't. I can't imagine that. That's you know. I can't imagine dressing up like Fred Flintstone is really a uh, really the best way to get girls. But <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't really get us any girls. And I was kind of in between girlfriends at the time. I think I uh, how, let's see, maybe it was a month before I had actually had uh, actually just been dumped. When I was actually actually after I realized I'd been dumped by her, I was actually rather glad I was dumped by the girl. Because uh, that was my junior year in high school. So <laughs> Now, if you would have went as, say, maybe George Jetson, I mean, you know, maybe you would have got somewhere. Oh, of course. You know, all the ladies digging the future guy. There you go. He could fold his car up and stick it in his pocket. Yep, exactly. If I could do that, I would be James Bond, and that would be it. And then you then you probably wouldn't have a problem. Yeah, not a problem. I'm going to go out on a limb on that one. Yeah. Well, see, well, if you're going to do a show called the Neverland Podcast, and your catchphrase is the podcast where you never have to grow up, who else do you want hosting it but by somebody who will dress as Barney Rubble and go see the Flintstones movie? I I got nothing for you on that one. I, <laughs> I can't I can't top that. Exactly, I am perfect for my own show. <laughs> <laughs> Which is odd, considering that of course I did create the idea. So I'll just take my own credit. There I am, patting myself on the back again. Oh, hey, break my arm it, if I keep that it, up. It, it's like one of my bosses at work says, do something, even if it's wrong. Exactly. But, yeah, I can't help it. I'm a big kid, but I, I found a woman that married me for it, so I guess I'm okay. Well, they're one of the uh, one of the announcers for the Philadelphia Phillies, and I know you're a Kansas City Royals fan. And That's okay. I'm, Your team's probably better than mine anyway. I don't know, I'm man. Not too bad, though, now this year. I think well, last I checked, we were in second place in Central Division, so, yeah, you know. The Phillies have a bunch of guy and guy, a bunch of guys named Bob coming out of their bullpen, and it's getting bad. <laughs> uh, I think I actually you posted something on Facebook that something was horrible was happening, and actually you guys are having a bad downturn or something. Well, since since they won the World Series in '08, they've gone backwards every single year, uh, and and uh, they're hitting the ball this year. They're getting really good starting pitching, but the bullpen is just an absolute abomination, and it's killing them. It, no. It's. I, I think they've probably. I think they've lost four games where they were tied or winning after the sixth or seventh inning already this year. Sounds like the Royals after our 1985 World Series win that we haven't even been back to the playoffs. I don't think since, but our pitching yeah, went think. downhill. But now we've got pitching, but we've lost a lot of our hitting. But they're slowly coming back around. I think Mustakas now has got three home runs under his belt already, so he's starting to come back. I'll throw you a nod. George Brett's one of my all-time favorite non phillies he, he was just a cool dude. Plus, the way he went like, absolutely bonkers on the pine tar home run is just the coolest thing. Oh, yeah. That's that's intense right there, man. Oh, yeah. I, I can ruin the, the love of George Brett for you if you want, but I won't. <laughs> but it's, it's still a fun story. Uh, I've actually gotten to hear the audio uh, where I don't know if he knew he, his mic was still on, but he's telling the story to some, some other guy and everything of the a time he had gotten food poisoning somewhere in Vegas after eating some shellfish. And uh, let's just say he didn't make it to the bathroom. What row? Yeah, it's this whole story. <laughs> Excellent filled, I tell you what. They have to bleep out half of it any time I've heard the clip on the radio. It's it's a pretty funny story, and you got to give him credit to being able to just admit it to people that he had had to change his pants. <laughs> he, he swung and missed. Yeah, pretty much. But we still love the guy around here. 
He's just mm-hmm. awesome. We've got we've got a road named after him going past Royal Stadium. Mm-hmm. Hall, you don't find Hall of Fame third baseman every day, you know. Right. And even, you know, he played first base a little bit, too. But, batted, batted, batted 390 one year. Mm-hmm. Uh, heck, I remember even when I was on a rotational softball league, uh, We every time you'd show up, you'd just get the number in the order that you arrived to play, and then that number was also your batting order for that day. Uh, but at the end of the season, they just uh, let us, okay, well, take home whatever. Um, they were kind of like vests that we had for our uh, for the thing. And so well, I'll take whichever one home for a souvenir that you played on this team, and I made sure I grabbed that number five. There you go. And I wish I still had the thing, but, you know, after a while, I guess it doesn't fit anymore, so you can't just wear it around and say, yes, all right, I played softball, and we lost all but two games, and the two games we won were against the same team that apparently was worse than we were. Woohoo! <laughs> it's always good to have a goal. Yeah. All right, so we they won't. But that's okay. I've never been much of an athlete, but it's fun to watch. It's fun to play. Even if we're going to lose, at least I was playing. There you go. Yeah, okay. I, st- I still play 35 and up men's league baseball. I played through college and everything like that. I still have fun with it. It's pretty much the pretty much the the one thing that I do outside of the house when I'm off. I like you give me a bat and a ball, and I'm a happy guy. I don't know if I can catch anymore. It's been so long. What do you think? One more song? Uh, I'm actually I've got a list. Uh, we've 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 done five on each side. I've even got some honorable mention things. But sure, throw another song out here. What the heck? All righty, let me pick just one. I'm going to go one more nod to the Sherman Brothers. And in honor of Carousel Progress's 50th anniversary, which was just two days ago, as of this recording, I'm going to go with Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. Again, an upbeat, optimistic song celebrating where we've come from and where we're going with an added bonus of there's a video clip out there of Walt Disney singing it with the Sherman brothers. Oh my goodness. I think I'm going to have to track down that video and I'll rip the audio off and play it right now. Okay. So that's where I would put that if I have it. (laughs) I I can, I can send it to you if you want. (laughs) That would be good. I have it. See, that's another one of those rides that I didn't realize existed. We didn't spend enough time in Tomorrowland when we were in the Magic Kingdom. As far as we got is uh, – uh, now, the guy I went with, uh, he kind of paid my bill. It was his idea for me to go because he knew I'd never gone. And uh, we, we hit Tomorrowland kind of in the evening, and uh, I actually got him on to Stitch's Great Escape because I was like, oh, look, a Stitch ride. And he was like, oh, okay. Um, but I actually liked Stitch's Great Escape, but, of course, I, I don't have – any memories of Alien Encounter? Since oh, cool so was. good. So good. I've seen some video. It looks like it was awesome, yes. It and would I, scare the pants off of you. Yeah. And that, I think that's why I could have I could enjoy the Stitches Great Escape because I don't have memories of what it used to be, so I was able to take it for what it was. So, But we got in there. We did that. We did Buzz Lightyear, and then uh, Space Mountain was closed uh, back in 2009 for uh, repair – or not repairs, but well, renovations or whatever they were doing, refurbishing. And so we didn't really spend any time in Tomorrowland, so I didn't even realize the Carousel of Progress was there until, of course, I listened to a podcast. I'm like, hey, this sounds like it was a neat show, and I missed it. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things – there's nothing, like, sexy about it. There's nothing glamorous about it. You know, it's not rock and roller coaster or the Tower of Terror or anything like that. But it's just a cool show to realize, one, now that it is 50 years old, but just the technical aspect of building a theater with an, with animatronic characters talking to you with a, with a stage that rotates around the entire, I mean, with a theater that rotates around the entire stage. And then having the stages to the right and the left that rotate for additional scenes. And then, again, under the premise of it's 50 years old. Yeah. And it's just, and it still has a degree of, it's got a degree of humor to it, a little bit of tongue in cheek humor. It's, you know, it's got some cutesiness to it. No privacy at all in this place. Do you, by the way, do you know who says that? Mel Blank. Yes. Absolutely. You got that, too. Not to mention the fact that it's the only thing, Disney, that I can possibly think of that actually has a toilet joke to it. <laughs> think about it. When's the last time you saw or heard anything remotely about a toilet in a Disney anything? 
uh, other than perhaps the chili dog burp that smells like a toilet. Um, I can't think of anything else. Yeah, it, my, exactly. <laughs> and since we're only young ones, but you could be immature forever, let's throw a toilet joke in there. Sure. Um, I will say it is time for an update. Yeah. The the finale scene, especially the Christmas finale scene, they're still talking about car phones and laser discs and high def TV. It's it, it's it's time to it's time to up the ante a little bit. Yeah, it'd be sad though to lose uh, the voice of the father who was now I forgot his name. Uh, you know he's he was the narrator of the Christmas story. You know, Rex Allen. Yeah, it'll be so sad to lose him. You know, having done it, it's like yeah, because if we have to do a, n- a new future, then we have to replace the voice, and then that means that we have to replace the whole thing. And oh, it'll be so sad to watch it go. Well, are you talking? Are you talking about the narrator in the current iteration or the classic one, the original? Uh, well, the, the, apparently it's the current one. That's the the voice of the father is the same guy who was uh, and actually was the writer and the was the narrator for the Christmas story for a Christmas story. I mean. Um, Okay, because when I mentioned Rex Allen, he was the original narrator in the 1964-65 World's Fair version. Ah, I don't believe he's I've the, ever heard the audio of that one. He's the narrator of the pre-show video where, with the aforementioned Walt Disney singing with the Sherman Brothers. Oh, cool. And then he cameos as the grandfather in the final scene. Oh, cool. But huh, I can't think of that, that guy's name, and I hear you clicking away over there. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking it up for you. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's it's really cool to hear him, and I, I hadn't thought of him being the voice until I think it was on Inside the Magic that uh, Ricky Bergani had mentioned. There I am, plugging somebody else's podcast again. Um, there you go. He had mentioned uh, that it was uh, that guy. Gene, from the Gene Shepard. Gene Shepard, that's right. And I, I would, and since he's he's passed away, I'd really, you know, I would love to be able to see the Carousel of Progress with his voice still in there. But I know they really do need to update it. But it'll be sad that they'll end up having to lose his voice because they'll need to replace. Yeah, you know, the final scene, and unless you find a good Gene Shepard impersonator, uh, you know. Yeah, he, he and Rex Allen both passed away in 1999. Mm-hmm. And Mel Blanc also passed. He's, he's been gone since 89. Yeah, but all you need is that one clip, and you can always use it. So No privacy at all around this place. Exactly. <laughs> okay, but since we've gone up to six... Uh, I'm going to go. I'm just going to throw together all these honorable mention things because there are some things I kind of thought would probably be like a given. Um, so let me I'll do the honorable mention things first. I'm going to say okay because the majority of people uh, and you, you've already probably figured this out about me absolutely love the haunted mansion. Yes. Uh, and heck, I'm, I'm weird. Okay, I became a fan of the haunted mansion uh, probably back. Maybe 2000, 2001. It was when I was still dating my my now wife, but we were still dating, and uh, we still had a Disney store in a mall around here that's now actually about to be torn down. We had it, so we had a Disney store, and I went in there, and I found a tape that says a spooky night in the in Disney's haunted mansion. I was like, well, this, cool. It was around Halloween time. I said, like, cool. I'd like something spooky to listen to. It's Halloween time, and it was actually a cassette recording of the old vinyl with uh, Ron Howard in there. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I heard that, and I was like, oh, this is really kind of cool, but I didn't completely understand the descriptions that were going on, but I was like, this must be what the ride is like or something. And I, I started just listening to that all the time, and then that movie came out, and now it wasn't the greatest movie. I still had fun with it, but it was kind of neat to kind of see some things fleshed out and hear some of the music. The, the scoring, and I was like, oh, this is just like my tape. This is great. So then I started, you know, later on, I started kind of looking at YouTube stuff, and uh, I found DoomBuggies.com, and I looked at all the pictures, and I was like, this is really cool. So when I got to Walt Disney World, I was like, okay, I know we're trying to circle around the park, but I was always eyeballing. I spotted that haunted mansion. I was like, we're going to get over there eventually, and I'm going to ride this as many doggum times as I can. So I have to mention Grim Grinning Ghosts in all its iterations, be it when it's playing in the ballroom, when it's playing low and spooky or when you get to the graveyard and it's being rocked out gotta love grim grinning ghosts yes now, honorable mention i will i, I, thought, I will you know what? somebody's gonna mention it if i don't but you didn't so <laughs> i will i will stipulate to that one yeah. good call good call it would have been cool though on that seat on the tape and cd that you're talking about it would have been cool if they would have had paul freeze as the ghost host instead of pete renaday not not that i'm knocking pete renaday's version as the ghost host but when you've been on the ride as many times as a lot of us have, it's 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 a little bit. It seems a little bit disjointed to hear Pete Renaday as the ghost host. 
Yeah. Well, since I come from the tape with Pete Renaday, when I heard Paul Freeze, I was like, well, this is different. Oh, but I like him. <laughs> it's Especially because I recognized his voice. I'm like, wait a minute. This is Burger Meister Meister Burger, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you recognize his voice from like basically everything else in Walt Disney World. <laughs> yes. Everything Walt Disney World, even some Hanna-Barbera stuff. Uh, Boris Badenov. Yes, Boris Badenov. Just Paul Freeze was the man. He, I think he did more voice work than Mel Blanc, I think. I don't know. He's everywhere. And then Pete Renaday, I got to love him just because he was Splinter. Fair enough. You got to love the guy. You know, so. very, very talented guy. Just He's just not Paul Freeze. It was just it was disjointed as Paul Freeze. I mean, he did it. He did a great job. And if Pete Renaday was in the haunted mansion itself, it would have been fine. Yeah. All right. Next thing that I'm going to put as an honorable mention, and it's another ride thing, and uh, it's a ride I really wish I hadn't missed. We saw it, but we didn't know what it was, and I was not the one calling the shots most of the time I was there because I I was kind of the rookie. But Soren, that Jerry Goldsmith score. Oh my that, gosh. It, it is excellent. It, it is. is. It is really excellent. That's one of the ones that I, uh, other than having to track down on the internet to try to find like a download of it, uh, when my friends just this past uh, October, I had mentioned they went to Disney World. I saved up some money and I and I told them they just released a brand new soundtrack to, to Disney World. Make sure you get it for me, please, with this cash and a bunch of other stuff. I had them buy. I've actually got a. Uh, speaking of the Harry Potter park, they bought me a snitch. I have that here on the shelf. But <laughs> nice. I was so son, happy to have the Soren music on that set, and I was like, "Yes!" My my oldest son has the Gryffindor banner on his uh, bedroom door. Awesome. My middle, my youngest son is my middle kid. He wants Slytherin. Well, there's one in every family. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> All right. Next thing that I was going to put as an honorable mention. Now, apparently, not everybody really likes this movie. But you know, before I even had seen Pete's Dragon, I I got on a, a CD set that my wife had, Candle on the Water. Hell and Ready. Oh, yes. So yeah, very, very mention. touching emotional song. Yes. And I didn't even know what the song was about because I didn't have the context of the movie. But uh, taken in a different sort of context, you could sing that song in church. And I'll leave it at that because I try not to shove anything on my show. But <laughs> – if you if you think about the song, you could kind of take it in a different aspect, you know. Yeah, so I'm, I'll, I'll go with you on that one, sure. And pl- plus, the Elliot float in the Main Street Electrical Parade is the coolest the po- coolest part of the parade. So, oh, and I really wish I'd have gotten a chance to see that one too. It is massive. It is animated. It blows steam out his nose. It's got a um. Oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the kid's name now. Right, riding it. Elliot, is it? No, Elliot's the dragon. Oh, thank you. Elliot's Pete. Duh, Pete. Pete, Pete's dragon. Duh, I'll be all right. Can you, can you tell I worked overnight we last night? We are smart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm new here. <laughs> oh, but yes. Uh, so we have to go with that one. I did get to see at least Spectro Magic. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to see it go because the music of that was really good, too. It was catchy, yes. Yes, very. I'd actually need to track down that music as well sometime. That could almost be an honorable mention because that was really great music. Uh, it was rather fun though when we were watching it when um, – oh, now that name just went out of my head too. Uh, I almost wanted to say Balthazar, but that's not right. Chernabog. Chernabog. I, I, you knew what I was talking about. When Chernabog goes by and he opened up his wings and the lights, and it was so awesome, and the lady next to me goes – who or what in the world is that? And I had to lean over and go, like, go watch Fantasia, lady. Please. So I said, yes, go watch Fantasia. You'll see that character. He's he's an icon, okay? Honorable mention, all of Fantasia. There you go. My wife's, I think that is her all-time favorite Disney movie. She's big into classical music and everything. So we have both of those, and she just adores those. All right, the final, final, well, okay, after the honorable mention section, this is actually would be my sixth, and I have to put this up here. Uh, okay, other than Little, Little Mermaid, of course, I mentioned was kind of like that big turning point that turned me into a Disney geek. But one of the first Disney films that I saw that we had rented that I ended up having to watch repeatedly, and, and the same night that we rented, we, I watched it like two, maybe three times, was Lady and the Tramp. And so just because of that, I had to put in Bella Note in there because it is probably the most famous song from that movie. But still to this day, I absolutely love that movie. It is just great. Just I'm kind of a dog person. Granted, oh, we have a cat here, but I'm kind of a dog person, and just I mean, some of the behaviors at the beginning of it, you know, when with Lady as a puppy, we've I've gone through so many puppies, I'm like, yes, exactly, that's what they do, and so I absolutely adored that movie. 
I even bought the book Novelization when I was a little kid of it and everything. So Bella Note, it was a great song in there. It's a fun song, and uh, it, it just fits the movie. Wonderful, wonderful film, and so that's going to have to be my uh, my number six. Hard to argue with that one, too. I mean, here here's the problem. There are so many good songs, it's actually easier to pick the ones you don't like than it is the ones that you like the most. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, and I'll give a tip of the hat to my buddy Dennis, who we, we were down in, uh, in Disney last year during Pixelmania, and we were talking about how good just the in-house park music is, the live entertainment. And he basically said, he goes, dude, it's hard to find bad music around Disney. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that resonated, and he's he's absolutely right. Like I said, it's probably easier to find six songs I don't like versus the six that I like the most because there's so much of it. It's just, it's just so good. Yeah, which is why I was running down honorable mentions because I was like, okay, these are probably because some of the other stuff, uh, some of my tops are probably somebody else's, else's top, so I better have some backups to fall on to. Plus, just because there's just so many and it's hard to pick, I've even gone through – I've got uh, – uh, just a folder just that I just labeled Disney, and I just put all my Disney music of all sorts on there, and my car, actually, I can plug a flash drive in. So I've got a flash drive even that I just loaded full of Disney music, and that's because I'm a courier and I'm in the car all day. Other than listening to podcasts all day, it's nice to be able to just like, you know what? I need to hear some Disney music because it will make you feel better when you're having a bad day. And it's gotten so bad, though, my wife has actually at some at some point said, like, okay, can we hear some music? Okay, no, don't put in the Disney drive. I've heard enough Disney music, you know, because I just have so much of it. And I start tracking stuff down from podcasts. I'm like, oh, hey, that was a good song. I wonder what that was. And so I'll start tracking it down and adding it to the list. And, and my friends will have a CD of something I don't have. I'm like, hey, I want to borrow that CD. I'm going to put it on my computer, too. And so I say, friends, always let friends borrow and share your Disney music. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, I've got I've got many 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 gigabytes of Disney music. I mean, three quarters of my iPods Disney Park music, and the other half's like dirty jokes or something like that. I, mean, it's, <laughs> I, I, I span it all. Sure, go from one one end to the other. Here's my like family friendly stuff, and here's the stuff I can't let the kids hear. Yeah, it's like all right. Now that we listen to Grim Grin and Ghost, let's listen to like Jackie the Joke Man for another hour or two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well, with that, I think I probably better wrap this up because I got to get up at three forty-five in the morning, and we're running late, man. So, what's it? What's the name of this? Show? The Never Ending Podcast? Uh, no, the Neverland Podcast. Oh, okay. But Never Ending seems to almost be the way. This is going to be a long one, so I'm going to have to edit and edit and edit just to try to, you know, maybe keep it. Although some of the other clips I could probably use, like when you mentioned a Weird Al and have that little story, I think I'm, I was thinking in my head, oh, I'm going to keep this and separate it because eventually I'm going to just do a, a show full of Weird Al songs because you got to. And I have a bunch of that, too. So, I, I can't believe I admitted in public I went to a Weird Al concert. It works for me. That'll make you fit in around here. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, I, I think the tickets were like 10 bucks or something. That's the only reason I went. Wow. There's there like 10 bucks. I had nothing better to do that day. <laughs> oh, admit it. You laughed at some stuff. <laughs> it was pretty interesting how he changes his costume between every song. That was pretty cool. Oh, one of these days I will get to see him. Of course, you know, here lately, you know, a lot of the pop music stuff that he's covered, like on his last album, I'm like, you know, I don't even like the, the song you started with, so I'm kind of like, I don't know if I want to hear it or not, but uh, we'll see. I, I, the stuff that's always funnier to me is stuff that's because I'm familiar with the song and I liked the original song, so a lot of the, the some of the 80s and some of the uh, 90s during the whole grunge era when all of us were in high school were all grunging out, and when he, when he did the parody of Nirvana, it was the greatest thing. Absolutely. <laughs> Amish paradise. Yes. <laughs> Although, let me tell you, to, to, to watch 50-year-old people rocking out to Weird Al singing Another One Rides the Bus, <laughs> you, you got to get yourself into your happy place when, when you start seeing that kind of stuff. Oh, I'd probably lean into my happy place and just laugh hysterically. I'm like, you know what? I hope when I'm 50, I'm still having that much of a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I hope I could carry that little. <laughs> I don't even know where I'll be in twenty years, but I hope I'm still still a big kid. It was it was it was an eye opener. <laughs> I just know somehow know that will be me. My body may not keep up with my brain, but I will I will be there in spirit. You'll give it a darn good try, right? I'll give it a darn good try. I need to get this old body back in shape. I used to I went from having the body of I looked like Shaggy somewhere across with Gilligan to a little bit in the middle here, so we're all there, brother. Yeah. I'm like, what happened, man? 
So I, that's surprising when I run into people that I went to a high school with, and I'm expecting, how in the world are they going to recognize me? I look entirely different now, and I've gained like 70 pounds compared to the little 120-pound stick I was. But, you know, there were people who said, oh, hey, look, it's Jeremy. And, of course, I have I used to have people come up and recognize me that I couldn't tell them from a hole in the wall. I was like, oh, hey, you know me and you even know my name. I don't know who you are, but I'll pretend I remember you. I'm still trying to get the visual of Shaggy Cross with Gilligan. Yeah, it was because I had some people that would nickname me Shaggy and, then, and I had another guy who would nickname me Gilligan because I just had that tall, skinny build. Were you wearing a bucket hat? Nope. I was just tall and skinny. And I've always kind of wore baggy T-shirts because I was that skinny. There you go. So it kind of works. In fact, uh, the one guy who kind of thought I looked like Gilligan actually for uh, my birthday got me a book. Um, it was like a biography of uh, – jo- was it Jim Denver or John Denver? Was he also named John Denver or Bob, Bob Denver? Bob Denver. Bob Denver got me a biography of Bob Denver. He says, like, this is just special for you. I'm like, gee, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very little. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where that book is. I probably still have it somewhere. I never read it, but I was like, oh. It's like one day I will, you know, flesh out. And I did. Boy, my senior year, I went ahead and I uh, I, I was just trying to fill in my senior year with classes, so I took a weightlifting class, and I started to kind of bulk up. I was like, you know, by the time I started in college and I was taking some karate classes, like I'm starting to look pretty good with a little bit of muscle on this skinny frame. And then I was stupid enough to smoke for a little while, and it killed my super metabolism, and next thing you know, I'm gaining weight. And I'm like, hey, look, I'm starting to flesh out. But oh, my gosh, this is too much. Now, now, oh, no, I got a belly. Where would this come from? So... Yeah, that's the way it works. Don't hey. smoke, kids. <laughs> Getting old is terrible. Yeah, it's well, you know, your body has to age. The brain, apparently, for me, it really didn't. And if you start listening to the fun. show, you'll realize that. Oh, yeah, this guy's still a twelve-year-old. But you're having fun, and that's all that matters. Exactly. That's pretty much why I, I am, started a podcast. I, cause I I'm am like, all about. Fun. I'm all about having fun as often as I can because life's too serious. It's too short. There's no need. There's absolutely nothing to be gained from being a stick in the mud all 24-7. And, you know, I just want to go through life and have a good time. Yep. Which is why our saying here in the Neverland is always to keep your pixie in your pocket. That way you can pull her out, sprinkle a little pixie dust around, and get you a happy thought and go off to Neverland anytime you need to. Well said, brother. Yep. And I say it at the end of every show. <laughs> And now I'm starting to get creative. Actually, at the beginning of the show, of you know, to, when you got to pull your pixie out so we can go off to Neverland. Uh, now the uh, intro of the last week's show was actually, hey, I hope you, I hope you've been keeping her in her pocket and not underneath the couch because your boogers go underneath the couch. Pixies don't like to be under the couch with your boogers. <laughs> Touche. Exactly. <laughs> Touche, my man. I'm. I don't know where I come up with this stuff. <laughs> I don't know where I come up with three quarters of the stuff I say, and neither does anybody else. But it usually, it's usually pretty funny. Yeah, at least in my own head, I think I'm funny. I'm a, I'm a genius, and I'm I'm I am my own George Carlin. Oh sure. Yeah, yeah. My wife kind of likes it when I because uh, I, I I try not to swear, uh, but I kind of invent some of my own. And uh, the biggest one that I ever came out with that my wife has just loved was hot flaming monkeys. So that is her favorite one. of my swears. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I don't know if you listen. I don't know if you listen to any like financial talk radio. I'm a big Dave Ramsey <laughs> fan too. Yep, big Dave. I've done, I did the program, dude. I'm still in the middle of it. We've got, I think, a little over three years left. And once all those those debts are paid off, that's when I'm going to start putting up that savings for, to take my wife to a Disney park, whichever one well, we get to. That's we uh, well, we we had we we didn't call and scream, but we had our we had our call and scream moment. <laughs> and uh, do it at yeah, home. we. We've got our Roth IRAs. We got, you know, we got our, we got money put aside, and you know, we got everything paid off, and life is good, man. I've got an IRA that I rolled over from a four hundred one k that I need to put over into a Roth, but uh, yeah, I think I'm going to wait. Maybe I might wait till I'm fifty five, so I don't have to pay the penalty for pulling it out of the one to to move it over. Yeah, if you convert it, I think you do get even if even if you directly convert it, you still get whacked on it. Yeah, you still get whacked, and you end up having to pay tax. So I know that the tax is going to be there regardless, but at least I can save myself the penalty for pulling it. Uh, right now, where I'm working at, since I'm doing it, I'm as an independent contractor. I'm I'm really not getting any retirement built up at all. Uh, I'm also barely paying any taxes because my expenses are so high. 
Uh, which is why I'm, I, I don't know if you've seen, I've been actually trying to work up my resume and like, I, I figure, okay, I've been doing this long enough. I need to get back working in an office. Maybe I need to go back to school, you know, maybe need some help with my resume. So I've actually have some people kind of helping me with my resume. And really, if I was able to follow my passion and stuff, I, I really would actually be like to work in radio or if I could get paid to do a podcast. And, you know, maybe a company needs to advertise something. I don't know. I'd love to get into voice acting because, really, this starts from when I was a kid and I used to record myself on, on cassette tapes like I was doing a show all the time. And then when I discovered podcasting, I was like, wait a minute, why aren't I doing this? So I started studying how to do it and I said, well, if I was going to do a show, what kind of show would I do? So, you know, over the course of, I guess, of about a year is where I was kind of planning up this whole show. And now I'm I'm now currently 20 episodes in, 21 if you count this, once I've got it crunched down. So I'm off and cooking now. If I could just find somebody to pay me to do this kind of thing, or you know, at least go to back to college and maybe get a degree, uh, my bachelor's in uh, radio and media uh, communications or something like that, it'd be good. That would be beauties. Carrie, you want you want the red cup with your water? Yeah, please. Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, actually, uh, through having my 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 site's my site's been up since 2006. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just started like really hammering it on like Facebook and Google Plus and all because I've been around, I've got a following, but it seemed like like last year when we we, uh, we built a house, we had our third kid, and I kind of, I kind of went radio silent for a little while, and there's a bunch of like younger guys that don't have family commitments and all that stuff and they were they kind of like you know took off running and all so i was like you know i gotta get some of my thunder back that's why i started started posting all over the place again and you know really rolling out like big heavy content you know, like the stuff i'm put you know picture the pictures of the day they're not just i don't just pick them at random like there's if i post something there's usually a reason for it and um where the hell is it? Oh, so I guess the point I was getting at is like I've been writing, I've been writing and being a photographer for Celebrations Magazine since it started. I know the guy that publishes; he's a buddy of mine. I've done, I've gotten, I've gotten paid to do work for Swan and Dolphin. Yeah, you talk about you talk about having a good time there. You, go, you know, Swan and Dolphin calls you up and wants to pay you to come take pictures for them, and yeah, you know, getting paid to do something I'd be doing anyway. Yeah. Ryan, would you grab that little clip of you saying that and put that when you're kind of introducing on your website too? (laughs) Yeah, please don't. Good little thing to throw in there. It's like, hey, you know, he's done stuff for Celebrations Magazine, Swan and Dolphin. Which Celebrations Magazine? I'm thinking because uh, I, I, I uh, after uh, and, uh, I've, I've been listening to like old episodes of WDW Radio and Inside the Magic and Window of the Magic. I, I went after I discovered the shows. I went back to the beginnings as far as I could, and I've been listening all the time. You know, catching up through the last couple years. Um, and I, when I found out about Attractions Magazine, I thought, well, hey, cool, I might want to check this out, Orlando Attractions or whatever. And I think my subscription has just run out, and I'm not sure if I want to renew. And I'm kind of thinking, well. Well, that's been fun for a year. Now maybe I should try Celebrations Magazine out and see what that one's like, just for fun. I'll tell you what, I, and it's, I'm, I am partial to it because I'm a part of it. I don't, I you know, I'm not the publisher. I just contribute to it. The every each of the every magazine to me, I think is like it's like a it's like a it's like a thing of art. The guy that's the, the art direction is so so nice on it, and he puts so much time into the into the design and the layout and i mean it's like you get to, when you're reading it like you barely even want to touch it because you don't want to like crease the pages or anything and like it's it's printed on heavy stock i mean it's nice it's a nice product yeah i think i'm gonna have to get that one now especially if it's the if it's the same art director that uh put helped put together like lou Mangello's uh new book that he did like the 102 ways to save money to go to and at disney world which I did a review of that uh, on on the show because he was asking for people who'd had podcasts to do reviews. And I jumped up instantly, like I will review it. Please send me a copy. And oh my gosh, the pictures are gorgeous in that, and that the way it's set up, uh, even with the PDF, I'd like to get myself a nice, good print copy of that one. But the pictures are fantastic. Are those some of your pictures, by the way? Not that I know of. I kind of had wondered about that. It's like, wait a minute, if he works some stuff with Celebrations Magazine, I know Lou Mangello is associated with that in some fashion. So it kind of made me wonder. It's like, I wonder if those are some of Tim's pictures in that book because the pictures are really, really good. <laughs> nah, he's he's, uh, uh, he's never asked me to do anything it's, uh, official with him. Um, the uh, the art director for Celebrations is Tim Foster. He does Guide to the Magic. 
Oh, yes. He's been actually on uh, WDW Radio a lot. Yeah, him and Jim Corcus. My goodness. And those two guys are pretty bright. My God. Yeah. I don't Corcus know how Jim Corcus remembers all the things he does that whenever he I've heard him on a, a past show and all the facts he can pull out about the parks. I'm just amazed. Yeah, Jim Jim's a buddy of mine too. Whew. So you get to meet all the cool people. I'm stuck here in the middle of the world of America and I don't meet nobody. <laughs> well, you you stick you stick around long enough you you run into people after a while. Yeah. That's what I'm kinda actually gonna do is like when I'm trying to encourage some of these other people to maybe come on next time I'm gonna do like something from Disney, I'll be like I'm gonna go to Paul and say, Hey, Tim did the show, you know Tim, right? Okay, hey. It's your turn, Paul. <laughs> Once I get Paul Barry on, other people who know who Paul Barry is might come on the show if I have another Disney topic, you know. Yeah, Paul Paul Paul's good people. Yeah. He sounds like good people's and everything. Paul's, I've, I've Paul's talked to him a few people. times on Facebook and everything. So he, I actually was when I was looking for a good recommendation on an MP3 recorder, uh, and I was wondering, it's like, hey, you know, anybody got a good recommendation of kind of stuff that might be affordable? And he actually recommended something that when I looked it up, it would be really good, but it's way out of my budget. But uh, it's the one like he's using to do his park recording, so it has this that great binaural sound. Is that uh, that zero thing or whatever? Uh, something like that. But oh, it was expensive. And I, I, I actually got one. I think it cost me about $50. I've got this little Sony thing that's, it's only got one mic. Oh, here it is. Yeah, it's a little Sony, um, uh, I forgot what kind of model it is, but it only has like one mic on it. But I, what I mainly needed, mainly needed to do with it, I found a lot of other uses now doing the podcast, but, uh, I do some film work. Mm -hmm. I, w I wish I had money for better equipment, but, uh, uh, there's this guy that he, uh, he was on, the like 200, you know, or the bicentennial anniversary Lewis and Clark trip. He was, he on a certain stretch of it, he was Silas Goodrich, who was the head fisherman on the expedition, and so he basically played that role. And because he's learned so much now about Lewis and Clark and about this person Silas Goodrich, he was going around to libraries and stuff, and he'd give this presentation. And he actually had memorized sections of the journal of Silas Goodrich, and he'd go and he'd quote it and he'd tell stories. You know, oh, cool. There. Well, he got tired of doing those, so he what he wanted to do is make a documentary, him and this other guy, uh, of going around in full costume out actually kind of more on locations. And I thought, okay, well, if we're going to be outdoors and I want good sound quality, what I needed to be able to do is find a way to mic him up and record his audio directly off of him. So I got this little recorder, and I was looking for a good mic, and that's where um, uh, Paul had actually recommended the good binaural one. And I thought, oh, I can't afford that, but I did find... Uh, a thing where I can plug in a microphone into this, and I could uh, kind of uh, attach it to his skin, under, so you wouldn't see it sticking out of his lapel. So I, I put him, and it's actually just a computer microphone where it's like a, normally a headset. Mm -hmm. and, but I just kind of taped it with the microphone pointing up towards his head, and then I had him, you know, showed him how to work the recorder to, to start the recording, slide that into a pocket or something, hidden it out of the way, and then I could film from. I could be a long distance away and have him walking along. Excuse me, walking towards me, but I've got, of course, good quality sound that was with him the entire time. So, and as you know, the video, a video is only as good as the sound, right? Because you know, I don't, I don't shoot high def video because, unfortunately, I've, I've got a good Sony handy cam, but it doesn't do high def, unfortunately. Um, but high def going to high, high def's gonna cost you about a gig and a half for every thirty seconds. Yeah. Well, I've, I've probably got the room now because now I, I just got this new computer. So, you know, I've got finally went to Windows 8.1, and I've got a 500 gigabyte drive on it, and then an external drive I attached that's got a terabyte on there. Of course, that terabyte is pretty much full of all my music, a lot of it Disney, and a lot of my other video stuff. And I even every time I, I make a DVD, I burn an image and I keep that image in case I need to come back to it and make more copies. So, plus all of the labeling stuff and everything. So I've got it pretty full up. I might have to get another drive one of these days, but I've got a couple. I've got a four T in my inside my tower, and I've got two three T externals. That's just my backup stuff. I've got I've got hard drives out the rear end, full of pictures. I bet too. Uh, they fill up quick. Oh yeah, I can imagine. So well, yeah, uh, I, I would like to be able to maybe expand my video business course. Mainly, what I'd like to do is because I so far I've only gotten calls to like do some lecture things or whatever, and this also helps. I can now mic up who's giving the lecture, so if they're going to start wandering around the room, I still got a good solid recording on them. But uh, I'd love to be able to do just um, just small little kind of goofy films, even if I was just doing stuff for YouTube. Sort of like what the Dawes brothers are doing. I wish I had half of their equipment to do some of the stuff they're doing. It's amazing. But uh, I did do a little short film, kind of. We, we, it was half scripted, half improvised, called Supers. That the, unfortunately on YouTube, I had to edit out some of the music we had chosen because we'd used uh, 
uh, like ma- mainstream type songs and everything that were kind of appropriate for the movie. But it was kind of a joke on uh, there was something Marvel did because it was called the Civil War. And basically, what it was is I'm sure you're familiar with Shield if you've seen some of these Marvel movies. Uh, there was like this kind of terrorist bombing that was actually a mutant who could actually detonate himself, and he killed a bunch of you know he detonated at a school and killed a bunch of kids. And apparently, they found out there was like a uh, a reality show that was currently being filmed of some like young super powered people who were like their reality show was watch our super team go and fight these villains. And because of that, they were kind of fooling around and didn't take things seriously enough to where now all these kids get killed. So suddenly there's this registration act that went through to where everybody had to register their secret identity and all their powers and then submit to training at S.H.I.E.L.D. and become full S.H.I.E.L.D. agents so they could control all the superheroes. And, of course, so you know, Captain America led a group of heroes that were like, no, this is ridiculous. This is, this is against our liberties. We understand you're trying to keep things safe. You know, So it was dealing with a lot of modern issues. But anyway, so we took the concept of this reg- superhero registration and we thought, okay, well, let's mix the Marvel and DC universe, kind of make fun of the whole thing, and let's say, well, what if Spider-Man and Superman had decided both to retire? And so it's been a few years, and because I'm a little overweight and Phil's kind of a big guy too, and he's actually Superman height, and I'm, I'm a huge Spider-Man fan, he's a, su- a huge Superman fan, so we played those roles as overweight versions of those, those characters that decide <laughs> after however many years that we're fat and we're in our 30s, we want to decide to make a comeback. And so we go and we find Batman, and he tries to get us back in shape so we can go out and fight against Iron Man, who's the one who was the head of the registration. And we did it for laughs, and I put it as like in five episodes on YouTube, but they made me change some of the songs around because Warner Brothers owned some of the songs, and so they it kind of ruins some of the jokes on some bits. Um, but, you yeah, know, I want to do more like stuff pretty, like that. Yeah, that sounds like it was pretty. Yeah, we thought it was funny, at least. <laughs> so. But I've said it to some other people. There, there are some sections that I don't think everybody quite gets some of the things we're making fun of because it is, it is kind of very much nerd comedy. Uh, but some of the stuff is straight. You know, we we did a, a Benny Hill style chase where uh, nice Superman and and Spider Man are chasing around fighting over a uh, a whopper. <laughs> You got the whole uh, <laughs> yep, the whole thing did it uh, where we uh, we we kind of moved somewhat you know slowed down like running where we did the over dramatic steps that way when I sped it up it was this, the crazy walk stuff going on and a bunch of things nice. that we did uh, that's probably the best bit that we did and we actually fit it to the story to where it was showing how all the training was paying off because we actually managed to use our powers that we had kind of lost because we had gotten fat so. <laughs> That's, that's so pretty good. Using our powers to fight over a hamburger. And uh, Philip was such a really good sport on that because the scene that follows after, of course, Superman's going to win that fight, obviously. Uh, but we have where he's finally got the got the Whopper and he's kind of looking at it and we use the um, – oh, I forgot what the actual name of the song, but the boom, chicka, chicka, bow, bow, you know that one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About. We're playing boom, that as he's yeah. like – yeah, we're, so we got like tight shots of his eyes kind of widening and some sweat running off his head and him kind of licking his lips and everything. He's going after the thing. Uh, so <laughs> he was a really good sport about it and everything, and it turned out to be really, really funny. So, Dude, e- email me the link to that. I want to check that out. All right. I will. Uh, heck, I even think I got on Facebook, I think I've got some of the links where I didn't have to change the uh, – because I uploaded to Facebook, and I don't think I had to change the music on Facebook. Yeah, send me, send me, yeah, send me the links, I'll check them out. All and right. then, because uh, I got, I got to get rolling here. Yeah. Um, really but uh, <laughs> if, um, and if you need any of the park, if you need any music that we talked about, I can, I have most, mostly everything I mentioned. I can always, I can send it to you if you run into a pinch. Yeah. I, I'm, I think I do have Zippity Doo off somewhere. They were like the movie version, uh, and I know I've got Super Califragilistic because I have that soundtrack. Uh, All right. Well, I'm, I've got the Aladdin soundtrack, so I can get that one. Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow I have, but I don't really have anything from the World Showcase loop. Uh, I can send it. I don't I'll have send the Illuminations it. of the holiday thing. So, like, the right. World Showcase and the Illuminations. Um, and the, the, the Disney and the Sherman Brothers, I have that as an MP3. I can always cut that out and send it to you. Yes, 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 yes. So just, just send me an email, tell me what you need, and I'll get it to you. And if you need it, if you want a couple of pictures for your web, for the website, for the show notes or something, let me know. That actually be. See, I haven't really put any pictures up on the show notes yet. Yeah. Uh, Same. Well, we can send you. Because uh, yeah. Well, heck, uh, you can even send it. It's really easy if you can just you can send it over to podcast at neverlandpodcast dot com. I can probably remember that. Yeah, you're it's be- right. Even be- on the website down, I think at the bottom, I think is my contact thing. You're, you're better. You're better off emailing me and harassing me for it though, because tomorrow I got to get up, take my kids to school, work overtime. 
I'm coming home, coach my kids' baseball team, blah, 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 blah. And then we're going to have company all weekend. So okay. you're better off just emailing to me, and I'll print it and put it on my to-do list. Uh, you've got an email probably on the Magic and Pixels. letter on your Facebook page is probably got your email. Uh, uh, t- Tim at themagicandpixels.com. Oh, well, that's easy enough. Just Tim at themagicandpixels.com. Right. Or if you go to my website, you go to the About, you go to the about tab on the drop-down. There's an email link on there, too. Okay, I'm writing this down. Yeah, and I'll either send it because I don't know how much how much space Yahoo would let me have if I used my regular Yahoo account. So, but I think my uh, since I'm paying for the Neverland uh, um, hosting, I think I actually get more room for. Well, I can always I can al- I can always throw it in my Dropbox and email you a link to it that way too if I need to. Dropbox works. I yeah I, I use that a lot to, whenever I'm sending clips to my clients to be able to show them. Well, this is where we're at right now. Um, I actually had to send some of that out today with some of the uh, adding the audio onto those uh, clips just so they can see that I am working on it. I've have, I've had been so busy on the weekends I haven't got a chance to get this documentary together yet. So uh, yeah, Dropbox is good. Okay. So the, all right, so the Magic and Pixels com. Yep. All right, I'm writing that down so I can I'll send that over at you. All right, brother man. All right, have always a, a pleasure. Let's, always a pleasure. Let's, yeah, man, always a pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. All right, yeah, because I. I had another idea of something I was going to bring you on for, but now I forgot what it was. <laughs> I know that feeling. Uh, see, there's, that's the thing with doing something where you're just kind of bringing stuff from your childhood up. I've got so many things I can do that I always I have a hard time sometimes deciding what I want to do this particular week. Oh. Well, whatever you want to do, you know how to get a hold of me. I'll jump on whenever I can with you. All righty. Sounds good. All right, brother. See ya. Right, see ya. Nice buns. Soft, fluffy, and ultra-low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread. The delicious, ultra low net carb bread with incredible taste and texture. Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving. Plus, high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Order from hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10. H E R O.co.